So if you guys could go ahead and uh, follow the first little setup for today of creating a class 10 directory and then putting the org file in there and then opening it up in Emacs. I'm switching things up so that the org file is in the same directory as we're working in. So if you do use the control C, control C for org babel to run a set of code, you can without having to worry about which directory it's in. Uh, just put everything in the same place and life is easier. If you look right here, make directory dash p tilde slash class slash 10. All right, is anybody stuck getting this file set up? Hopefully by now it's starting to become a little bit familiar. CDing around and making directories and doing a wget. You gotta watch out for me. Like I showed you curl again last time and my brain defaults to wget, but then it gives me trouble and then I walk away from it. What are you looking for? Yeah, looking for um, a shell. shell. Um, oh yeah, go, if you have a shell already, you can do go under buffers, take a look. It's not going to save it from last time. You have to create a shell each time. So you can do a control X2. I've been leaving everything open on my... And then you can also suspend your virtual machine and just come back to it the next time and unsuspend it, but it's up to you. So then do meta X shell, press enter. There you go. should be in your job box. Now make sure that you've put the org file in your class 10 directory. So if you haven't done that, if you run it differently and it's somewhere else, remember that you can move files around with the mv command. mv 10, and you're lazy, I'm not going to write out the whole file name, 10 star.org tilde slash class slash 10, that's the number 10. Slash. So if it's somewhere else, you can move that file over to your class area. Did you copy and paste the URL as opposed to typing it? You didn't. You actually typed it and you mistyped the URL. So if you take a look at the class notes, scroll down in here. See how there's 10? Mm -hmm. Click in there and scroll down a little bit and you'll see that this code. So you can just copy and paste that. Because you were typing two Gs and it was it's Q as opposed to... So this is a Q and a GIS in there and you had GG. So see how right here you have two G's? Right. That's a typo. So be really careful with the letter Q and the letter G. Look kind of similar if you don't watch out for this bottom part here. We're gonna be using QGIS today, and that's a Q and a G. So let's get started, and I'm gonna help you guys out on your homework a little bit by going through doing the same thing you're doing. I'm gonna hide my Firefox and do just from Emacs. So our first entry, creating a a work log entry. I'm going to go open up my log file. So tilde slash Dropbox logs research research tools. Then dash in my last name dot org. This is the log I'm keeping in this class. I keep a separate one, but I'm doing this mostly just so that you guys see exactly the same thing. I'm going to bring back the notes here. I'm going to start off by giving myself some hint. I'm going to include a file. If you ever need to bring text in from another file. It's control X and then an I. So I pre-wrote some notes here of things to do. So I wrote those up. This is to make sure that I follow them while we're doing this. And here's how I make an entry. After you've gotten through this class, if you like this kind of style of note taking, you can pick your own style of how to organize notes. You can do like a file per day. You could do organize them file per project. It's totally up to you. I'm going to make a day. So in here, I'm going to say September. 29th, I'm at CCOM today, New Hampshire. I'm gonna do a control C, a period, put in the date. Now, if my date was wrong, I thankfully today, the computer is agreeing with when it is, but I can click on the day if I don't like the day, so I, if it's the wrong day, you can pick that. I'm gonna press enter. We now have the date stamped in there. I'm gonna add a tag with control C, control C, so if you're following along, you can create an entry for yourself in your log file inside of your Dropbox. I'm going to tag it with day and teaching, since today for me is all about teaching. I'm going to create an entry with two stars. This is a second level heading. And I taught teach geo -Osh, taught all about gravity. And so here I can say, I'm going to tag that with gravity. And I was pretending that I was Jim Gardner for the day. So I'll tag it with his name. And so we talked about Smith and Sanwell quite a bit. That's all an entry has to be if you want. It doesn't have to be anything special. But here I'll create one for research tools. 
Research Tools, QGIS, and Shell, and hopefully some IPython. And if you're working on a day, if you know you have some things you need to do, you can create yourself some entries. So I've got a list here with some entries that need to get checked off. Create an entry for GeoOsh. I wanted to show you exporting a log so you can see what it looks like. So we'll do uh, control C, control E, the letter B. You now see, if your Dropbox is running, you should see those messages pop up. I know at least one of you has Dropbox not working. But af after you save your research tools log file, since it's in your Dropbox, it's going to send it over to, to there. I think I'm seeing the Mac notices coming through on my virtual machine. So I'm running Dropbox both on the virtual machine and the host. Ignore those. But in here you can see, here's my checkboxes from before, and here are my entries for today. And here I've tagged myself with gravity and that I was Jim Gardner. And you can then go through these things, see what they are. So that could be my entry for today. If you guys are working in a class and you, you want to take notes, like if you see something in the IRC channel, and you hopefully have all logged into the IRC channel now, then you'll actually have that available to you afterwards. Do that before I forget. Meta X ERC. I'm going to log into the IRC channel. You can do it through Chatzilla, or there's notes on how to do it with ERC. I'm going to say Research Tools, CCOM NH, Join UNH Research Tools. So anyway, that's the, the setup for that. You can go through and check these off as you go through it. And we're right here at Make a Journal Entry, put stuff in the directory, class 10, and export. And so now we're on to go use QGIS. So any, is anybody stuck at this point before we jump on to actually? I just have a question. Where, where did you get this uh, checklist? I can't find that. Yeah. It's nowhere. It's oh. my it's my <laughs> checklist. Oh, okay. You can't have my checklist. You got to make your own. Okay. No, um, <laughs> it's hidden in my Dropbox, which you don't have permission to read. Uh, okay. Yeah. But yes. Export log entry. You didn't export. So, do you remember export for org mode? How did you make the HTML file before? So org export, if you want to see it, was it's control C, control E. And then the letter B for an HTML export. Are we supposed to be making our own checklist? You can do whatever you want for your entry for today. Okay. It's okay. however you want to use the notes for yourself. And okay. each person has to figure out what's going to work for them. Okay. You can make a checklist or you can not worry about it. You can write a paragraph, you know, whatever okay. you feel like. B is in boy. This is the um, HTML and open in the web browser. That's my favorite one. There's lots of other ones, and some of them are, I'm not even sure what to do with some of these other. There's like an XOXO format or something like that that I'm, I don't know what that is. So if you need to get back to your notes, we've been doing a lot of stuff from the keyboard, but I'm gonna do it with the GUI a little bit here so you just see them. I can go select my buffers. I'm gonna go back to the org mode file for today. This next entry, for this class, if you haven't done it, you need to go watch the four videos that I've created for you on YouTube. They're about an hour and 15 minutes total. And they're there so that you can hit pause and think about stuff. You can go back through it. You can review later on the semester if you forget. It goes through creating org mode files, exporting. And I'm gonna assume from now on that you actually know how to do all the stuff in there. I'm gonna keep moving unless someone stops me on a particular topic. In general, I'm gonna assume that you know how to get around Emacs a little bit. If you hit trouble, let me know. But in general, I'm gonna assume that you've got it. It's time to get going on the Python stuff and spend less time on Emacs because I think Python is more fun in the long run than Emacs. I like Emacs, but Python will actually get our job done. So let's go view some data. And last time we did Google Earth and it was grumpy. So I want to show you a tool that isn't quite so grumpy on the virtual machine. Let's go, if you've already got the files from last time, we built a KML of Boston, the construction, and we have an XY file. If I'm over here in the terminal, I'm in class 10. So if you do a PWD, I'm in research tools class and then 10. If I do an ls dot dot slash 09, if you see, oops, I've got them compressed. So b unzip 2 09 star dot bz2. I'm going to go ahead and uncompress those because for some reason I compressed them. So if you do ls dot dot slash 09, 
that looks up one directory is dot dot, so that's the parent directory. And we're going to go look in class 9 that we had last time. So I, I want to copy over cp dot dot slash 09 2007. And I'm hitting tab for completion. And I'm going to copy over the KML. And I'm going to put it in the current directory, which is dot or full stop. And I'm going to hit the up arrow and do some editing. We'll do XY. So in your directory, you should now have your 10 org mode file for lecture today and your Boston construction KML and XYZ. And if you don't have them on your disk, if you had trouble with the last lecture or you deleted them, which I did to myself last week, you can use this wget command and I put them up on a server so you can just pull them back down if you can't find them on your computer. Did I enter <coughs> something here? Because uh, this is what we wanted, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. You got XY and KML. Yep. Did you copy them to dot? Yep. Do an LS-L. Or, or here. do another one. I did an LS-L. It's a little confusing when it wraps. So see how you've got two. Oh, yeah. You're good. It's just when the terminal was short, it wrapped around. Oh, okay. So and I have that same thing where it wraps. It's hard to see. So you did a CP and there was an error here saying missing and you were missing the period. So hit the up arrow to that last command. Space and then the period. So you need it like with copy, you have to have a destination. Yeah. And so you hit enter. And now if you do an ls-l, you'll see the first one, and then you do the same thing for the xy file. That's the thing I just wrote, overwrote it. As so you, if you look at the file name, you've got a couple extra characters in there. Right, because yeah. I was trying to get out of. Do a control x, control f. Oops, control g, because it says you're in the mini buffer down there. Control x. Okay, control f. f. And then capital D. You need to go into your Dropbox, so capital D, R, and then R, and then tab, and then log. Or you can hit tab again, and it'll, and then tab. And it's got a couple there. Yep. So re I just, did I over... I think you didn't. Press enter. And there it is. You open up a different buffer that was very similar named. So now you feel... Because I think I accidentally saved it when I was trying to get out of... Did you save your org file into the right place, and are you editing the right one? Let me take a look at your keyboard real quick. So if I click in here, and I open a file, you actually are working in an org file that's in your top-level directory. So if we do a control X, and then a K, I'm going to control X, K, we're going to kill that one, so it goes away, we're going to type yes, and we're going to open this, so control X, control F, and then you're going to say class 10 org, org 10 so now you've opened it, and if you do Control X, Control F, you can see that we're actually in that directory. If you save the org file in the wrong place, and you do Control C, Control C, it's going to work in that other directory where your files don't exist. So now if you scroll down to it, Control G to get out of that. Now if you search for CP here, so we've done that. If you go to here and you just run that, it should work. So type Control C, Control C to run that. Oh, yeah, you already have those. Okay, so scroll down a little bit more to the command you're trying to run. Oh, you're, you're, with the scroll wheel, you're going way fast. It's better to put the mouse away <laughs> and <laughs> ignore the mouse. Yeah. So I'm not sure which one you were trying to run before, but if you open up, a, if you do in here and do an LS, you have everything you need. So you're, you're ready to go on the next step. LS dash L. There you go. Yeah. And then just hit the up arrow. Let's start QGIS. So you can run this from other ways, but the easiest way is applications science. Uh, we've only installed one science application so far, but go ahead and run QGIS. So it was applications science. And once you're in QGIS, if you've ever used ArcGIS, this is similar, but a lot simpler. It doesn't have quite so many features running around, which often can be a benefit because... So we're going to go under Layers, and you're going to add a vector layer. We have that KML from before. In QGIS, it doesn't know how to display every kind of KML, but it definitely knows how to display lines. So go ahead and hit Add Vector Layer. You'll have to hit the Browse button to start cruising around and find your data. And if you remember, we've been working in our class directory. Double click that. Today is lecture 10. 
and nothing shows up. It kind of looks depressing. Uh, if you look down here on the bottom right, there is a menu of file types. These are all the different file types that QGIS, this version, knows how to open. Uh, if you worked with marine charts before, you might remember S57. So if you have an S57 chart, it'll open it right up. I don't know what it will do, but hopefully you'll see some of the chart. We're going to pick KML. So pick KML. And you should see 2007 Boston Construction KML. Click Open. And why are we not? Oh, select it, and then click Open. There we go. And then you have to press Open again, because the first open wasn't enough. If you guys squint really hard, there is a very faint blue line on the projector that is impossible to see that should show up better on your screens. The projector isn't very good at color. Does everybody have? lines on their screen. Now you have to interpret this like an ink blot test and tell me do you see like a chicken doing a dance or... <laughs> and so if you have data of any of those formats and you just want to see what's in that file, QGIS is your friend. Open it up and see if you can open the data and see what you get. We'll use this a whole bunch throughout the rest of the semester. We'll learn a lot more about it. But I want you to at least see QGIS once with some data. And we'll see some of these data sets, and we'll just use them again and again in different ways to look at them. So now, at least I've shown you QGIS. We haven't done anything very interesting with it, but you've seen some data. So we'll go ahead and kill QGIS, send it away, close without saving. Is this free? This is a whole zero dollars. Uh, it, what, it, what it comes down to is it counts on people like us to contribute back to it. And if you're not a programmer, you can contribute with documentation or examples telling people about it, teaching your friends about it. So we've now gone through the QGIS section. And we're going to get into a, our last topic with the shell. So we're going to use Bash. From now on, after today, Bash is just there in the background to help us move files around. And we're going to not worry about it too much. We're going to focus on Python after this. But I want you to see an example where we build a movie. So we're actually going to go make a movie. And to do that, we need to learn a little bit about bash variables. They're not as easy to follow as Python. They've got some quirks. So I'm going to split my screen, and I'm going to show you a couple examples. We're going to learn just enough to do a little script today. And if you get into this and you want to learn more, we can point you at a number of good books and people to talk to. But let's go create a shell. So I'm going to do meta x shell. Give myself a terminal here so I don't have to keep jumping around. And we'll try some variables here, just to see. And to warn you, this class, a lot of it is about precision. It's being careful to type exactly what you need to type. And when you're doing the examples, if you start typing random things by accident, it can get a little crazy. If I screw up, it's going to give me some errors. So the first thing we're going to do is create a variable. And so if I do testing equals 1, 2, 3, I have not done what I typed before, and it might not work. Instead of working, it says, I don't know this command testing that you want, to, want me to go run. So we have to make sure we type it exactly. So down here, you can't put spaces around those equal signs in Bash. It's very picky about that. So if we say testing equals 1, 2, 3, that's actually created a variable called testing. And it set the value to be the string 1, 2, 3. Now in Python, you won't see the dollar sign. But we had echo shell last class where we just tried something out. That's the shell that you're running. You have to use a dollar sign. This is a special variable. We can go look at our variable, dollar testing, and it prints out one, two, three. So if I say testing equals hello world, echo dollar testing. So now I set it to hello world. So that's how you create a variable in the shell. It's definitely touchy. And it also has a problem in that if we create, if we run another program and it needs to know that variable, it's going to lose it. So if we create a second shell, we're going to run bash, and we're now in a new shell, and we type echo dollar testing, there's no testing variable, it's gone. So if you try to run things inside of another script and you set a variable, it's not going to know about it. Python is going to be less picky about that, it'll keep track of things better for us. I think it's easier to follow what's going on. So if we do exit, we'll leave that one shell. Is so there a way to know what shell you're in? 
Let's see if I can remember how to do that. Echo dollar. So there's a variable called shell level, S-H-L-V-L. This is pretty advanced stuff. You, you can write that down, and if you use it, I'll be very proud of you. Uh, I think I've used it a couple times in my life. And then if we type bash again, and we type echo dollar shell level, it'll now say two. A little confusing. This is just, just to give you a little flavor of what's going on. The trick is, if we want that variable to stick around and be used elsewhere, we're going to have to say export testing equals one, two, three. And that keeps that variable around so that any program that gets called with that gets set. And the case where this comes into to become important is if we type echo dollar editor, there's no editor. If you want to tell the system that you have a preference that you like Emacs, you can say export editor equals Emacs. And now when it wants to, to have a text editor for you, it's going to use Emacs rather than VI. It's going to default to VI, and you're going to get a weird interface that you've never seen before, and you're going to be very frustrated. Being able, it has this weird export mechanism. It gets very complicated. And when we go to Python, you're going to not worry about anything like this. So this is my advertisement for Python over shell. But let's go ahead. We've done our export testing up here. We're going to now type bash again to jump into that second shell. So we're now in this new shell space. And if we type echo dollar testing, we still have our variable. So when you see export, that means that it's going to stick around for any child process. If you, if you run a program from in there, it will know about your variable. If you follow the, the videos and you start looking at setting up some of your parameters, if you actually need to edit your bash RC down the road, which we may need to do, don't worry about it right now, but we'll probably come back and see this again. So I wanted you to at least heard it once. So the second time you've heard it, maybe it'll stick a little bit better. We'll be setting things like your, ed your editor equals Emacs. You can set up your printer this way, the default printer in the building, things like that. It's not necessarily that much fun, but it's important to know. And we've at least done a little. So if you call anything from this, once you've set it, it stays in that shell and we'll, we'll follow on to other programs, but it won't go to everywhere on your computer. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so if you look at the video, there's a, in the, the online video, if you do less tilde slash dot bash rc, this is your setup file for the shell. So go ahead and hit enter. When you were doing the testing, behind up there. Do a signals and a break. And uh, try signals and a kill. I would do control x and then a k. And enter to kill that buffer. And then open up a new shell. It was confused. So do a meta x shell. The terminal not being fully functional means that inside of Emacs, the, the programs in there can't control the display as much as they would like to. So if we did it over here in a real terminal, and we did less tilde slash dot bash rc, it kind of like the man page where you can sort of scroll back and forth and work through it. This one is generally kind of unhappy. But your bash RC file, we'll see down the road a few times, contains all of your settings. So control X, control F, tilde slash dot bash RC. And you're going to see a whole lot of fancy shell scripting. And down the road, you'll, you'll learn bits and pieces of it as you go. But it's going to do some pretty fancy things in here. And I don't actually follow all of them. Some of them are pretty advanced. So this is what controls your entire system. And in Windows, you can set up like your environment through the control panel. This is way more powerful than that. And with that power, with power comes in and complication. <laughs> but I want you to at least see it now, and then we're not going to worry about it until we actually have to come back. And I feel like with this stuff, you need to see it a couple times and then try to use it a few times, and you'll start to get the hang of it. So let's kill that. If you need to get out of it, you can type a Q from your less, or if you want to kill your shell, you can do a control X K, just kill it dead, press enter, type yes to kill it, and it's gone. It's the great restart. So let's go down here and we're going to, you might not totally have a good feeling for variables in bash, but 
when you work through Python, you'll see variables, and then you'll go back to Bash later on, and you'll start to get the hang of it. But let's create a script. I think this script will be fun because it has a lot of meaning to us as a group. Go down to the creating a script section. I see a face palm. You can always do a control L. Oh, so if your screen gets all confused, it means that it's having trouble redrawing your screen correctly. Um, so click on like Firefox down here on the left and then click back on your Emacs and it should look better. It had trouble redrawing the screen for some reason and I don't know why it's doing that. Control L redraws and centers things. Yep. So you can do a control X O to jump to the mini buffer. So control X and then an O. And now control G will quit out of that and you're back to being able to do whatever you like to do. So you can do a kill that buffer, control X and then a K and press enter and type yes. Do you have two different Emacs going? Uh, kill one of them. You're only going to want one Emacs at a time. Uh, and close it? Yes, close that. And how to open here? Uh, do a, you want to see the same file twice? Do a control X1 and then control X2. If you click on this link and your screen doesn't freak out on you, and you click on Mozilla Firefox, we are going to cause Lamont Doherty's web server to freak out, just like we did with uh, the IRC chat. And in here is a very boring looking directory that is actually really cool. This is the camera on the top of a ship, and every hour a new picture gets sent back by satellite to the Lamont web server, and you can see the latest picture from an icebreaker run by the US Coast Guard. So if you click on a random picture, and it's not the middle of the night, well actually it is the middle of the night. So here is the middle of the night in Dutch Harbor, Alaska. So this lets you see out into the world into a moving platform. Hopefully down the road more ships will let us do this. And if you zoom in, you can see what's going on in the docks in Dutch Harbor. So what we'd like to do today is to make a movie because this is a time series every hour we want to make a little movie to see what it's like driving around the ship. And I've done this where I've actually taken a whole summer's worth of pictures and turned them into a movie. And you can watch the Healy drive from Seattle up to the Arctic and back. It's a lot of fun. You can watch a ship sitting at the pier and watch the tide go up and down. Pretty crazy. So let's make a movie of those. And to do that, we're going to download one day's worth of images. But rather than click on each one and save them, because that's no fun, especially if we want to download several hundred, we're going to go crazy if we do that we're going to create a script that does it for us. And it will do it a lot simpler than it would, and it would scale to doing many days or weeks of pictures all at once. So let's go ahead and create a file that's a shell script. So what you can do is if you name it healy.bash in your directory, and you can click this link and it should take you to something that doesn't exist. So we now have a file called healy.bash, or you can do a control X, control F, and that file. And that file's not going to exist until we save it to disk with something in there. So how did you link that to make it become a new uh, buffer? That's a great question. There's two ways to do that. One is control C, control L to set up a link, but I can also switch to text mode. So I'm going to do meta X text mode. And it's going to get like with org mode, it does all the formatting and hide uh -huh. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's two square brackets, file colon tilde slash mm. healy dot bash with all the right path in there. Okay. Now I need to go back org mode. Uh, there's lots of fancy things in in org mode that lets you do stuff like that, and that's why I think it makes a great note taking tool for scripting and whatnot because you can link to files all over your computer. As you figure stuff out, you can point to it. You can open up configuration files, etc. So we're going to learn how to do a for loop in the shell. And we're going to loop over a bunch of stuff. So a for loop, it, and you're going to see that it's different between bash and Python. We're going to say for, and here you're going to put your variable. We've got for hour. So in this case, that's going to be hour. So we're going to do one picture every hour in. And then you're going to have a list of things that you want to have here. So we're going to do the first hour is 0, 1, since they count with zeros in there. And it's going to go all the way eventually up to 23. And so that's going to, each time through this loop, it's going to put a number, well actually it's a string that looks like a number, into this variable called hour. 
and then you'll be able to use that to create the right command line to go out and grab that file off the web. And I think I'm going to use wget, but I forget if I use wget or curl in this case. Do is the beginning of what you're going to run for each loop, and then you say done at the end. And then in here, you get to do stuff each time around with this variable hour set to be your number. So if you actually want to do processing on this, you could actually do a bunch of stuff, but for in our case, we're going to loop through it a bunch of times, and we're going to grab each hour this way. So let's start off by copying this section in here, the four hour in, and then do zero, one, and just do like up to seven or some number like that. Make sure you get the zero before each number. So you can highlight a region, do meta W for copy, go over here, paste it with a control Y. Yep, you'll notice that it changed the colors in here. This knows that it's a shell script and it's a type bash. So it knows about variables and for loops, so it knows for as a keyword. Now, this is where I ran into my very first bug in this code when I was working on it. I ran over to the shell, and so here I'm in the class, and there's no Healy.bash. Like, wait a second, where'd my script go? You have to go back over here and you have to save this. So you see those stars down there? Remember that there's, if there's stars, it hasn't been saved, and if you've never saved it at all, it doesn't exist on the disk. So control X, control S, and you can see that it now wrote the file into our path. If we go back over here, ls-l, there is now a healy.bash script. So let's give it a shot and see if we can run it. And this is a good first test to see if we're on the right track. We're going to run that by running a command called source and then healy.bash. So go ahead and hit enter. I'll leave this up here, but you hit enter and see if you get a whole bunch of numbers on your screen should say 0 through 7, 1 per line as you go through. So if you run it, it should look like that. So you're in the pager, so press Q, the letter Q. Yep. So now you can do an ls-l. And there you have the script. So type source space healy.bash. All you have in there, that pound file, is the autosave file. So go back to your Emacs, go up to buffers, and find your healy.bash, scroll down to it. See where on the fourth one down it says healy.bash? Yep, select that. Now you need to paste in the text in there. Now edit copy, edit paste, and save. Control X, Control S, or save, yep. Now go to the terminal again. Rerun your listing. Press enter. And now you, have, now you can try to source it. So what this is doing, Let's take a quick peek through this. It's doing the four hour. So hour is going to be our variable that's going to get set. It's going to have stuff in it each time through. Every time there's a space in between here, it's going to take one of those little bits of string and pass them through on each loop. And we have a very exciting command here that echoes out to the console. It's just going to print out whatever that variable is. So if we look over here, it's printing out 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4. So those are the hours of the day. We can use those in a command to build up the string that we want to get back. Because the, if we're looking for a day, the only thing changing in the file name for the day is the hour. So let's take a look through our examples here. We're going to use curl to go grab that. What we're going to do is we're going to add, we're going to add this curl. So I did a control space all the way up to the minus sign over there. In fact, we can just copy the whole thing, meta w. And now I'm going to go over to the other side. I'm going to delete this dollar hour and I'm going to paste with a control Y. I've changed up the hour because if I wrote in here echo dollar hour zero one, I now have a new variable called hour zero one and it's not going to work. So in bash, you can put curly braces, these funny curly braces over there around a variable name and then it will separate out this stuff from this stuff. And give this one a try. So, but make sure that you save it before you try it. So control X, control S, and make sure it says wrote the file down below here at the bottom. And rerun that. And hopefully you should see something like that. And if you're, if you're not, you either didn't save or you didn't type in quite what we're looking for. Uh, you did get some craziness. Control C maybe? 
Like yeah, so you're going to want to paste that curl inside right where the dollar hour is. So now, That's go. Question. Ben, question, yes. Uh, why would you use the source rather than make the script file executable like we did the other day? Because I was going to go back through that after I did the source. Uh, yes, good question. So now, to run this script and do the whole thing, let's add all the hours, 08 through 23, so you get to type as fast as you can without making mistakes. You can enter a ring. You can. It just gets really complicated with Bash. And I'll teach you all this stuff in Python, and you're going to see it's a lot simpler in Python. Yeah, so this is just a, like, let's have fun with it real quick. It's really powerful in that I wrote a 10,000 line Bash shell script set that controlled a spacecraft processing chain that did all the image processing for a uh, Mars spacecraft. And then someone took my code and wrote a 100,000 line version of that for Spirit and Opportunity that's still running every day. Actually, it runs every couple minutes. It's, but it's 100,000 lines of stuff that very few of us can even figure out what's going on. It gets a lot difficult to work with. Well, was something better available at the time? You, you know. We could have done Python. Oh. But <laughs> We didn't quite know that that was a better way to go. We thought that Bash would be simple, and then it was simple for the first 100 lines. So now if you save this and remove the echo right here, the echo was just telling us what it, what it was wanting to do. Now if we remove that echo, echo is a great way to test out a script and try to do it sort of before you run the whole thing. But once we remove that echo, it's actually going to go and get all those files. And we'll see if the system administrators at Lamont <laughs> call us up because they know us and say, what in the world are you guys doing? <laughs> so go ahead and source that, and we'll go attack their web server. It's going to go, hopefully you're going to see a whole lot of curl outputs as it downloads all those files. I see at least a couple screens going. We'll see if we can make it go really slow. And if you do, so there's the command down at the bottom again, source heli.bash. So now you should see something like that in your directory listing, a whole pile of stuff. Yep. Yep. Do the do the ls-l and take a peek and see what you've got. Right on. Lots of files. Take a look at your script. Go to Emacs. Did you remove your echo that was telling it to just print but not actually run the command? You need to remove the echo. Now save it, and now rerun your script. There you go. We'll see if we get blocked by their network admins. Did you, I noticed uh, we excluded the zero, zero hour. What, was there a reason for that? That's a great question. Do we exclude the zero, zero? So if we take a look at, OK. So if we look at their directory, the way they run, they have what's called a cron job that runs every hour on the computer. And that, that script runs just after the hour in the next minute. So it actually saves a file name with zero, one on there. And so we're following what they did. So the, the first minute of every hour, they write the file name as 01. So we have to follow what files they've put up on the web. What about the hour itself, the 0001? Did I leave out? Oh, they have a 00 in there. I left that out. You could add okay. it. You're, you're more than welcome to add it. This is, you know, this is sort of just messing around to try things out and see what you get. That's a great question because that shows sort of how programming works, and you, you try something out, and you say, OK, it worked for me. Give it to someone else. And they're like, why did you do that? That doesn't make any sense. And you're like, oh, yeah, that was dumb. And then you fix it and go on. So we have a whole bunch of files. If I make this go away with Control x 0, I don't want to see the script anymore. We can see more of this. We've done run our script. Now, I've mentioned to you Image Magic, and this program converts images from various formats to various formats, it's actually extremely powerful. It looks pretty boring when you start, but it can make movies and do all kinds of other weird things. So I've actually got written out here, and I had to look this up in my notes, I admit. It knows how to make it what's called an animated GIF, and if any of you browsed the web in the 90s, you probably saw a lot of these like silly flashing images and icons that were really annoying. You can convert, if you say delay, 100, this is the number of milliseconds between each frame that it's going to show. Loop zero, if you, it's how many times it's going to loop through it before it quits. Zero means never quit. We're going to give it all of our images. So star.jpg means take all of our JPEG images, and we're going to write it to 
and you can pick a simpler file name if you don't want to type it. I write it out to GIF or GIF or GIF, however you want to say it. And this is going to make an animated sequence of images in one file that we can load up in Firefox. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy this line. So meta w, I'll just do meta x shell, since I killed my shell. And I'm going to do a control y to paste that in there, hit enter, and it's going to sit there and look like it's broken. But don't touch it, let it go. So paste in that command and give it a run. Then it comes back. So it takes a good few seconds for it to run through and build this stuff. And if we take a look with ls-l store.gif, there is now, or gif, there's now a very large file in there that's our animated movie. And if you just run Firefox and your this image, so I'm gonna be lazy. If we paste in the file command, it's gonna tell us that we have a GIF. It doesn't know too much about it in this program, but at least it's told us that. If we also do identify, we might get something a little bit more. And identify gave us a lot of junk. It's a little confused, but better yet, let's just go look at it. So you can tell Firefox to open it up. Firefox. Okay, so if you look right here, you're, you've opened a buffer with some other name. So that's not a shell. That's just a random file. So do a meta x shell. Press enter. So now you're in the terminal where you can start running the commands. So press enter. And now you get to wait about 10 or 15 seconds. How do I open all what you had? All that junk? Just identify, which I shouldn't have shown because it just gave you gross output. So identify. If you got an error message, that's a great time to... That's a great one. Um, if you get a weird message about not a JPEG, I'll show you the command to run to see what's going on. Run, this is a great time to use file, star.jpeg. And hopefully, it should say everything is... Um, so where did you save all of your images when you run, ran the script? Show me the terminal where you did that. Okay, do a PWD in there? ls-l. Now go to your shell inside there. Do a PWD in that shell, just a yeah. ls. LSL or just that? Either way. JPEG. Oh, JPEG. Oh, you, my, that sorry. was my fault on that. Yeah, make sure you have so the E in there. The, this, is, yeah. this is a great illustration of extensions. Some people call it JPG and some call it JPEG. And so if you get used to one, they'll throw you for a loop. Fail to create trouble. Yep, you're ahead of me. I was going to explain to ignore that. So if you look back here, you're seeing out the window of the Healy. Yeah, we're... How are you doing, Bree? Yeah, you? I'm right with him. Oh, we're so... All, we're all behind. You're actually ahead. <laughs> then you go zooming past us. So with the right JPEG. Do, do they all and show up? The last one. There's something wrong with that one. I would just RM that file. Okay, yeah. And... <laughs> That? And then that's very just weird. Bring it back again no, something. I'm just, you don't even need it, so just RM it okay, and so go on. RM. And you need a dash in there. Tab is your friend in terms of completing stuff. Yeah. And then just RM that. And try rerunning the, the convert command and see if it goes. Okay, we've got people already viewing the movie who are ahead. I couldn't explain to you guys yet. Oh, yeah, you guys are all ahead. <laughs> not fair. So if we run Firefox. And I can explain to you, fail to create drawable. Ignore that. That's something from inside of Firefox where it's grumpy about something. It doesn't matter. A lot of times these programs have internal debugging messages and they're telling you something that's meant not for us, but it's meant for somebody who actually develops Firefox and they left it in there by accident. And you can see that we have an animated movie looking out the front of the Healy and it's actually working. So ignore that drawable. So do a control space, control A. Now you're back to the beginning of the line. Now do a meta W, and now go to the other one, and control Y to yank or paste. Now press enter, and now you wait. All right, so now you've seen out the front of the Healy. You can pick your day range. You could change that URL to be some other day. You might pick something where they're in the ice and breaking ice. This is how we know that Larry Mayer just got off the ship yesterday, whether he wants us to know or not. Yeah. We can see that they pulled in. Actually, I knew because someone else on the ship sent me an email saying, we're getting off the ship. 
So okay. that's why I picked yesterday. Before, in other examples, I've done breaking ice or something from last year where they're sitting in Dutch Harbor. But this shows you, uh, they've changed their camera so we can now see at night, which is a lot better. But that's created a little movie. And so this is the power of shell scripting. We could go in there and we could set up a range with a second for loop that picked days and we could maybe pick a, an entire month and you could make a giant movie of a month. The file size with an animated GIF isn't very good. It's gonna get big fast. But you're on the road towards being able to put together movies and create whatever you need to for your projects. From now on, we're gonna try and ditch bash as much as possible because it's sort of annoying. And we're gonna use a lot of Python. So hopefully if I've done this right, my lecture notes say now we're gonna to go to Python. There's one last thing I'm gonna show you, which is what Ben brought up and I almost forgot it. And this is why we have notes. So you guys saw that we had to run the source command. So we did source, don't run it again because you'll just re-download a bunch of junk. Uh, we had to do source. And if you look here on the left, this says RW for read, write, and then a read and read, meaning that we can read, write the file and anybody else on the computer can read the file. It's missing the executable. And the way you set something executable is you say chmod plus x healy dot bash. That's gonna set this file as executable by anybody. And if we rerun our ls-l, you'll now see a bunch of x's appear. So x means executable. I'm not sure this is gonna work. I think it, in fact, will fail. Oh, nope, ah, don't rerun it. But <laughs> the better way to do this, to protect yourself, to make sure that it actually runs the right shell because there are different types of shells and other people don't use bash necessarily. What you would do is I'm gonna go back to the Healy shell script. And if you put the first line in, if we copy this, it looks weird. The reason this is, is just because someone chose it and it, it has some funky properties that, that work for them. We're gonna see this also with Python. It's gonna be a little bit different for Python. This first line of a text file, if you say a pound or the number sign, bang or the exclamation mark, and then slash bin slash bash, whatever is after this is the program that's run and then given the text for this file. So this later on, we'll see these with Python in there and it will actually say go run this file as Python code. If you have this in here and you've saved it, then this means that if someone's using a different shell, it will go start up bash for them, run that script in it, and then at the end it will quit out of that bash. So it'll take care of everything for them. And you'll see this again with Python. So I wanted you guys to see that a little bit before we went on, but you can always just run source and it will then execute the stuff inside of a file within that shell. So let's go do some Python, because I like Python better. We're gonna be using a shell that's a little bit more advanced than the regular Python shell. We're gonna use IPython, I for indigo. And there's a, some newer versions out there, 0.11 and 0.12. If you read the documentation for those, there's more features and they'll get in the way and you'll try things that don't work. So we're gonna use 0.10.2. So I put the link in here for the documentation that if you wanna read more, read this version, don't read the newer ones or you're gonna try and find some really neat, neat features that don't exist yet in our version. It's getting some really fancy features for basically building documents and showing figures inside of the shell. The way we're gonna always run it is like this. We're always gonna give it dash PYLAB, PyLab. This is gonna set us up so that we're always ready to do plotting and graphing and run all the science tools. So let's copy that, so meta w, and go over to the terminal, or you can just type this if you want to on your own, and you can always type clear to hide all that junk. So that was this clear. Is a question, but why nope. can't I just do control C, control C? If you do control C, control C, that's meant to go off and run something that finishes, and IPython isn't gonna finish. We can set up IPython to run in a little shell window, kind of like the meta x shell, but that requires more setup steps and I haven't tested them yet. And you guys have done so much setup that I think it's not fair to make you do any more setup for a couple days. So go ahead and type clear and then ipython-pylab. The first time you run ipython, it's gonna look different than every other time because it's gonna do some setup. 
and we'll see if it happens here. Press enter. This setup, you're only going to see it right now, the first time. And if you switch machines, you'll see it again. This is setting up configuration files for IPython. So press return. And you're going to get this funny prompt down here in green. And I apologize if, for those of you guys who are colorblind, there's lots of red and green, and you won't be able to see them apart, so I apologize. You'll see this in one. This means we're on command one. And I want to teach you one thing before we go anywhere else, and that's how to get out, exit, and two parentheses. If you just type exit, it's going to tell you, I didn't like that. I knew what you meant, but I'm not going to do it. So please type those parentheses, exit parentheses. And now it's going to say, do you really want to do that? And you can press enter or Y. And now you're out. I don't know. There's many ways to exit. You can do some other funny things. It'll probably cause it to quit too. Exit with a capital E might have some special meaning. Okay. And we'd have to look it up. So just type exit and left parenthesis, right parenthesis. So you're in the setup part where it says, please press return to start IPython. So press, well, it's the same as enter. And then exit, and you're good to go. It's nothing like being stuck in a program and not knowing how to kill it and having to just kill the shell. So let's restart it, and it's going to look different this time. It's not going to go through that setup phase. So now, if you look right here, it started up without going through that initial setup phase. So I'm going to hit Control L to move my notes up a little bit here. And here you'll see I pasted in a little sample so you can see that again. Starting it up, learning how to do exit, and we're back into it. IPython brings with it a little bit of bash. It's copied some of the functionality, so we can do a PWD. Normal Python doesn't have this command. We can do an ls, and we'll see our directory. And there's a whole bunch of commands like that that we can do. And we'll be using more of those down the road. You can do a cd dot dot pwd. Now you're in a different directory, and you'll have to go back into so if we do an ls. You'll see that I'm now one level up. I can cd back into the class directory 10. Normal Python doesn't let you do that. And sometimes if you want to move somewhere else and go work with some files that are in a different area, it can get very frustrating. But let's go have some fun with IPython, and it's all set up for plotting for us with that command, dash pylab. We have our Boston XY file, and if I do numpy, load text, if you're used to MATLAB, it's the same thing as load. Type that, I'll give you a second to catch up, and then we're going to press tab, and I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that it actually figures out that, it wants, that I want it to complete the file name. If you press tab, it will then complete out as far as it can on the file name. This is also something that regular Python doesn't have. So if you're trying out some processing, this is a great way to explore files and have that same tab functionality that we had before. So we're going to try and load our XY. Go ahead and hit enter, and then it should tell you that it doesn't like what it's got. Oh, so you follow along with my CD and I got ahead of you. So do a oh, control U. U to click on. Now PWD, oh, okay. see how you're in class? You need to go back yeah, into yeah. 10, so CD okay. space 10. So now try it again and see if tab works for you. So it was numpy dot low text left parenthesis single quote. So if you look up here, if you didn't get an error and it worked, what I actually wanted you to type was this command right here. So this should give you an error because we have a comma delimiter in our file and we didn't tell it that it's comma delimited. It really wants space delimited. Since we know we have comma delimit data, we can say delimiter. And don't worry about trying to understand how I knew all this just yet. We'll go through it and learn how to read documentation for these functions and figure them out. So we can say we know what the delimiter is. And it's going to go off and load the data into an array. But we really don't want that either. So give this a go and see if you can get this to work. Yeah, you get to explore all of the keyboards. So there you get the error message. So now go and run that command with the hit up arrow and add the delimiter part. In this command, you guys are adding this text right here. And remember that you can hit the up arrow to get the last command and edit it. So if I hit up arrow, 
down arrow. It also has the history command. You can type history and you'll see your history. And I'll keep showing you more commands, but there's lots and lots of nice things like that. It tries to borrow all the nice parts of Bash and leave behind the crusty, unfun parts. Once you've got that, no such fun. Oh, see how you have two periods in there? You, yeah, but you probably type dot .xy. It gave you the dot, and then you added a dot .xy. Yeah, try that. There okay. you go. OK, so the last one I'm going to show you guys is that if we say unpack, it equals true. It's going to split each of the columns in this file into different variables. And we can say x comma y equals numpy load text blah, blah, blah. And this is going to put the first column into x, the second column into y. Press Enter. We now have loaded our data into two variables. If we do length of x, for example, there's 100, almost 120,000 points in there. And the last command of today is this plot command. So we're going to go ahead and plot our data. So plot x comma y. Press Enter. And this looks even more like a little uh, ink blot test. Hmm. And this actually is some pretty cool data, if you know what it is. It's actually a ship working on an undersea natural gas pipeline off of Boston. And you can actually pick out, if you know what they were doing, I'll show you guys. These are the ports where the ship stops at the end of the day. There they're going out to work. This is where the terminal is. This is where the pipeline starts. And you can see them work along the pipeline for many months. So these guys excavated the bottom, put a pipe in there, and then filled over it once they'd uh, welded it all together. And this is actually a construction project in the ocean, and we can actually see all of that through the data that was broadcast by the ship. And we're going to start going through and getting more comfortable with being able to do this kind of stuff and pull apart data, export it to QGIS and back and forth. QGIS actually knows Python. So you can actually program QGIS from Python. You can also program ArcGIS from Python. Look at that. Plots on almost everybody's screen. Yay. That's it for today, guys.